So once again, <clears throat> thank you very much for coming this morning. I know that um, there are leaves to be raked <clears throat> and lawn furniture to be put away and a lot of things that might otherwise occupy your time on a Saturday. And so I am very gratified to see so many of you who are here. I'm especially happy to see you all because of the topic that we're going to take up, which is the subject of dispensations. I was recently speaking to some folks in an assembly far from here, and uh, they were discussing to, uh, the possibility of having a weekend like this. And one of the brethren spoke up, and I appreciate his um, breathtaking honesty. He said, if we announce to the assembly that we're going to speak on dispensations, nobody's going to come because it sounds boring. Well, while I appreciate his honesty, I have to reply, and that's this. There is no boring truth in the Bible. There are boring preachers, and I hope they're not here. Uh, two out of three won't be bad. But I want to assure you that God's truth is very interesting. And what we're going to take up today, if God gives us help, is one of the most interesting topics that I know of in the Bible. It, 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 it amplifies the greatness of our God. It explains his purpose in working throughout the ages. And it presents to us his ultimate goal, his own glory, and the blessing of all who are linked with him. So thank you for coming, and I hope you'll receive a great deal of benefit from this. I want to read, first of all, as we always do, from the scriptures. And I want to read, first of all, in Hebrews chapter 1. And I am going to do some readings throughout my message. I struggle at times, as all preachers do, to, if you read all your sections at first, everybody forgets what you've read by the time you go to speak to it. So I'm going to try and uh, be honorable with you and sort of read as I go, <clears throat> and I hope God will use that to keep the word of God as opposed to my words fresh in your mind. Hebrews chapter 1 then, and we'll begin reading at verse number 1. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 1, <clears throat> God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, or in Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things. This next phrase is what has attracted my attention. By whom also he made the world. Now, I'm going to read um, some further texts that use this particular word, world, or, or world. I want to point out that this is a word in the language in which the New Testament was written that actually means the age. And so we might read this properly about the Lord Jesus. This is one of the introductory truths about him, that while it is true that he made the material world, that he is the one who actually organized and originated the ages. And so the one who is appointed heir of all things, by him, God, has made the ages. Let me carry that thought a little further. I want to uh, read in um, 1 Corinthians chapter 2. Uh -oh. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And verse number 6. Paul writes, 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 6, Howbeit we speak wisdom among them that are perfect, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor of the princes of this age that come to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, even the hidden wisdom, which God ordained before the ages unto our glory. And so you see that God, as the author of the ages, by necessity, exists before the ages because he's the one that created them. Let me read in 1 Timothy chapter 1. And I will not be 
speaking particularly from all of these verses. I, I will not be doing that, but I want to just point out this beautiful truth that we are confronted with here. 1 Timothy chapter 1, and you are familiar with verse 15, Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Verse 16, Howbeit for this cause I obtained mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe unto him to life everlasting. And Paul follows this with a doxology, a statement of glory to God. And this is what he says in verse 17, now unto the king of the ages. Again, the precise same word that we have been reading. The king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, one last reading in Galatians chapter 1. Galatians chapter 1. <clears throat> Galatians chapter 1 and verse number 3. Grace be to you, and peace from God the Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil age. Isn't that interesting? According to the will of God and our Father, to whom be glory for ever and ever. Let me tell you that this expression, forever and ever, occurs 21 times in our New Testament, and you don't need to remember that. Another way of saying it is just this. To whom be glory to the ages of the ages. Do you see what I've just done? I have taken you from before the ages. And I have told you about the king of the ages. And now we are reading this amazing, this amazing little doxology. To whom be glory to the ages of the ages. Amen. From eternity to eternity. I want to begin by telling you that God, from these verses that we have read, is the author of time and space. That God is, as we well know, before time. He created time. He rules over time. And he will conclude time. And so while men make clocks and calendars and try to divide time and to manage time, we want to recognize the utter supremacy of God over time. By the way, God inserts himself even in human thinking in some very interesting ways. This is a bit of humor maybe at the beginning, but you know that for many of us for many years, uh, time, at least in the Western world, has been divided into B.C., before Christ, and A.D., and O Domini, the year of our Lord. Now, of course, in our modern atheistic uh, secular world, of course, that won't do to think about Christ. And so we have come up with a new scheme by we, I'm not including myself. But now, if you are in the university, of course, it's necessary to talk about B.C.E., before Common Era, and C.E., Common Era. Can I ask you just a really dumb question? What divides before the Common Era with the Common Era? It is Jesus Christ. And so the harder that they attempt to run away from it, the more firmly they assert the great truth that God is before time and God is over time and God will remain after time is gone. So the question that we have today is really what is God doing in time? What is God doing in history? What is God doing in the Bible? Just very simple thoughts. Now, I just want to observe that sometimes when we come to the Bible, we come with a microscope, and we drill down to words and tenses and all sorts of fine little distinctions. But today, I'm selling airplanes. Because what I want to do is really elevate our thoughts and look at the Bible as a whole. 
and try from an elevated position to look at how God has managed and organized the ages and what God is doing in it. By the way, that leads me to a very practical point. We need to be men and women today who enjoy the whole counsel of God. I believe that in our busy era, our busy age, we have often focused on favorite chapters and favorite books and whatever is coming up next Wednesday night in the Bible reading. And we have lost perhaps a little of the sense of the Bible as a whole. I remember that when the Lord Jesus, to the two on the road to Emmaus, began to speak to them, what did he do? He opened to them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. So we're going to take a very holistic view of the scriptures, and we're going to look at them really from Genesis to Revelation. I want to ask a, a sort of an interesting question. Um, we never do this in a, in a gospel meeting. So everybody be clear that I am well aware that this is a ministry meeting. But I want to do something. I want to ask how many people, and you can put up your hand. This is the one time in your life in a meeting that you can raise your hand. How many people here have ever owned or used a Schofield reference Bible? How many? Go ahead and put up your hand. That is really remarkable. Interestingly, it's divided between people who are older and people who are younger. But I have brought for you today, I don't, I don't do this very often either, I've, I've brought an illustration today. Because when I was a boy, if you were a serious Bible student, you were introduced to and given this particular edition of the Bible. This one is well worn. I hope that reflects more that I used it rather than abused it. But nonetheless, this is my first Schofield reference Bible. I was given this when I was about 10 or 12 years old. And it's been something that has been a great influence on my life. And so in this Bible, there is an explanation of what we are going to talk about today called the Dispensations. This book, this edition of the Bible by a man named Cyrus Schofield, uh, is not the first that dispensationalism was understood. It's not the first word on it. It's not the last word on it. But for many of you who were raised with it, I'm going to remind you of what you heard when you were younger. And for those of you who were not raised with it, I'm going to try and teach not the truth of Mr. Schofield, but the truth of the Bible. Let's talk about dispensations, because Augustine once said that if you can distinguish the ages, then the scriptures will harmonize. In other words, if you can understand what God is doing in each progressive era of history, then you will understand more about God himself, and you will understand what his great purposes are. And so we want to talk about these different ages that the Bible explains. Before we talk about dispensations, I want to do three things. And these are very simple. And these have to do a little bit with how we handle the Bible and how we understand divine truth. The first thing I want to talk about is the fact that history is... Now, I don't want anybody to just jump off... Uh, the doc right yet, because I'm using a big word, but I'll explain it. History is teleological. That's an that's a old-fashioned word that just means this. It means that history is not random. That history in God's hand, the ages, are moving toward a very definite goal. Now, we're not here to play around with Nostradamus and his vague predictions about the future. We're not here to mess around with our Mormon friends who believe that God will establish a kingdom in, in uh, I think it's called St. Joseph's County, Missouri, and reign for a thousand years. We're not here to play with that sort of thing. We are here to understand that history is not unfolding really at the will of man, or under man's control. History is unfolding under the directing hand of God. History is going somewhere. God is not in heaven today saying, I wonder what's going to happen in the Middle East. 
God is not saying, I wonder who's going to be the next, I was going to say prime minister because I'm aware in Canada, but I know who the next prime minister is going to be, uh, but the next president of the United States. No, God is the great sovereign, the sovereign of eternity, but the sovereign of history. And so the great purpose of God is that history has a goal. It's going somewhere. Can I ask you a question? Let's just, if, let's keep this at a reasonable level here. If I were to ask you, what is the goal of history? What is God working toward? I mean, there's many things that you might say. You might say, for example, God is working in history for uh, the salvation of men. What a laudable goal that God should ever look into a world of rebels like you and I and choose to save us for his glory. Uh, are you happy to be saved today? Oh, good. Some people know that you don't have to be Pentecostal to say amen. Absolutely. It's a great thing to be saved. And God in his mighty purposes has chosen to save a people for himself. But let me tell you that the ultimate goal of God is his own glory. You know, that may be a concept that is a little difficult to understand because if you and I are to set as a goal our own glory... That's a sinful, wretched, prideful, wicked thing. Uh, the reason for that, of course, is, is that you and I are not worthy of glory. But for God to seek his own glory is that God longs that pervasively throughout the universe and throughout all of eternity that his essential, intrinsic, Glory should be seen. It's not prideful or wrong. It is necessary and reasonable that this great God should wish that as his ultimate goal, his fullest glory would be on display throughout all eternity. That glory will be displayed in his son, for example. That glory will be displayed in his people. But the glory of God is the ultimate goal of all of history. By the way, that ought to be your ultimate goal too. May I remind you practically? By the way, one of my exercises for this weekend is that we make sure that even though we're flying in airplanes at 30,000 feet, that truth gets down from where the rubber meets the sky to where rubber meets the road. If God's goal is his own glory in everything, what is my ultimate goal? I'll take up the words of the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. I think these words, if you had no other part of the Bible, would suffice to guide you in a life that would be pleasing to God. It just says this, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do. Could there be a more embracing phrase than this? Whatsoever ye do, do all for the glory of God. So the glory of God is seen as the ultimate goal, both of the Christian life, but ultimately of God himself as he works through history. Let me take up a second little point here. History is teleological. It is moving somewhere. But secondly, that revelation is progressive. In other words, God does not uh, give us uh, uh, what those of you in the IT world would call a a core dump or a, a data dump. God doesn't simply come and give us a digest of all the truth about himself and drop it on the desk in a great big thump and uh, here you are, here I am, take it or leave it sort of thing. To the contrary. God works progressively through the ages to reveal himself. I would say, of course, that that is the way that the scripture is uh, certainly constructed, and that is how we learn from the scriptures. You'll remember that it is line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. That is how our apprehension of God and his word proceeds. And so I want to encourage you today that see to see that in each of the progressive ages, the dispensations, that we are learning more and more about God until the day of the fullness of his revelation. Let me say this also, and my dear brethren are going to take this up in much greater detail. I'm just, I'm just the introducer here today. But I want to point out that man is also being revealed. 
And as God reveals himself, the response of man to God is also being revealed. And I know that one of our brethren later on is going to talk to you about that day in the future when every external impediment to serving and obeying God is going to be removed. When the devil is confined, not to the baptistry under my feet, but he is going to be chained in darkness. What are men going to do? You know what they're going to do? Of course you do. They're going to sin. Because the source of sin is not external to myself. The source of sin, the wretchedness of disobedience to God, lies within my own heart. So not only in the ages is God revealing himself progressively, but God is also revealing us as well. The third thing then is that God's uh, relationship with man is dispensational. And this is where I want to begin to talk about the dispensations and what they are and what they mean. I don't know if you uh, like to do puzzles. I hate them. Um, I cannot think of a worse way to waste a rainy day when you're on vacation than to do a 10,000 piece puzzle, but my wife begs to differ. She loves puzzles. And so on the odd occasion, I have been coerced because I love her more than puzzles, uh, to do a puzzle. And I've learned a couple of little simple principles about doing puzzles. Does everybody know how to do a puzzle? You do. Good, thank you for raising your hand. I'll try and explain it. I won't leave that to you. But nonetheless, the first thing you ought to do is find four corners. If there was a puzzle that had five corners, Mr. Shutt would just surrender. But normally, uh, you find the corners, and you look for the straight edges, and you look for groups of colors or lines, what are you doing? Well, I think just, I, I don't mean to be insult your intelligence by pointing out the obvious, but the point is, is that you need a broad outline in order to understand the details. And that is one of the reasons that I believe that this subject of dispensationalism is so important. It provides for us the overarching framework into which all of the truth of God will fit. Because one of my goals personally in understanding the Bible, and one of my goals in teaching others the word of God, is that the Bible is not a collection of random truth. That it is organized. That truth fits with other truth. And our subject of the dispensations is going to help us to understand this. The Bible is a big book. My Oxford edition that I have up here has over a thousand pages in it, uh, double column, single space, black and white, no pictures, and uh, it really is a, a big book, and none of us here have mastered it. I tell you, the older I get, I suffer from this, and every honest believer will say this, the older I get, the less I think I know about it. I'm discovering that God is a lot greater than I ever imagined. I'm discovering that I'm a lot smaller than I ever imagined, and I'm understanding that the Bible is more profound than I have ever conceived. But let me try and help you then to build this foundation, to build this outline, to build this structure that will guide us through the scriptures. Let me talk first of all about the word dispensation. It comes to us from uh, a word that means to manage or to regulate, or to administer, it often is used in this way. It is the idea of a person who manages the affairs of a household. Now, I don't know about your home, but that's not me. That's my wife. <laughs> and my wife cares for the administration of the house, and certainly in God's plan, I have a role as head in that relationship, but nonetheless, the daily administration of that home falls to my wife, the meals, the laundry, the, the things that fall in her sphere, uh, she manages them. And that really is the idea of a dispensation. It occurs in the New Testament, and I'm going to read a couple of them just now, but when we meet of it, and as I read about it, I want you to think of it in this way, the central idea of this word is this. It is managing or administering a certain era, a certain relationship, 
a certain period of time in the dispensation. So I want to read some verses with you, if I might, and see if we cannot um, understand this um, together. So let's look together then at the book of Ephesians, for example. Read in the book of Ephesians, please, chapter 1 and verse number 9. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 9, having made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him. Now, chapter 3, please. And I want to read a second occurrence in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3 and verse 1, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery as I wrote afore in few words, whereby when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men, as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So what I want to say, first of all, is that contrary to what many of our friends in the evangelical world are saying today, the idea of dispensations is not the invention of Cyrus Schofield. It is not unique to conservative Baptists or Bible churches or gospel halls. It is a topic that's introduced to us by the Spirit of God through the pen of Paul. And so let us see, first of all, that this is a biblical thing. We have not made this up of whole cloth. We appeal to the scriptures and show that God not only has a dispensation, for example, I will talk about this in a moment, a present dispensation that is marked by grace, but that there is a future dispensation, for example, called the fullness of times in which things are going to be gathered in Christ. So let me talk just a little more about this idea of a dispensation. Technically speaking, Uh, A dispensation is not just a unit of time. Um, One way of expressing it is is as an administration. Let me see if I can help you with this. Um, And I'm going to use an American, well, I'll use the Canadian one, I guess, maybe, but if I'm not accurate, you'll fix me up later and tune up my Canadian history. But you have just lived through the Harper administration. And you are going to, if God spares us, live through the Trudeau administration. Now, this is no place for political talk, so I'm not going to compare the two. But I'm just going to say this. Each of them is going to have some very distinct relationships between the leader and the people of this country. And in the United States, we talk about the Clinton administration or the Bush administration or the Obama administration. And in each of those, we are talking about the manner in which government was operated while these people were in office. Now, here is some very important truth. I want you to listen carefully. While God himself never changes, his methods do. Let let me just go back over this again. The idea of dispensations is not the idea of a changing God. I had a grandmother who was not saved, sadly, and she died the way she lived, apart from something that might have happened at death that I don't know about. One of the things that she accused the members of the family who were saved of was that that there were two kinds of gods. In other words, the God that she liked was the God of the New Testament. By the way, she did not know anything about the God of the New Testament, or she would have never said the foolish things that she did. She said, you know, the God of the New Testament's a really nice guy. I don't mean to be irreverent, but that's what she said. 
And, you know, he's full of love and peace and grace, and he embraces people. And isn't this God nice? She said, but I don't like the God of the Old Testament. The God of the Old Testament was this mean, cruel, capricious, violent, bloody God. Um, on many occasions, we attempted to correct her to show her that the God of the Old Testament was a God of grace. And that the God of the New Testament was a God who had come in flaming fire against his enemies and all who had refused him. But you see, she didn't understand that there's only one God and that he is absolutely unchanging. But you see, the point is this, that God works in different ways at different times. And so we speak of the way that God works in a certain era as a dispensation. And as God works in different ways, he creates new responsibilities. So that when God shows himself in a certain way, then man is expected to act in a certain way in response. Let me see if I can illustrate that for you in a way that will be memorable. Um, when there are only a husband and a wife in a home, there's a certain way of doing things. Now, for all of us who are over 50, uh, some of us look back nostalgically uh, to those days. It was just our wives and ourselves or our husbands and ourselves, and things were very peaceful, and we held hands and looked at the sunset and uh, uh, sent each other, no, no, back then we didn't have text messages. Uh, <laughs> we wrote letters. I know you've never heard of that word before, but it's a piece of paper with writing on it in an envelope with a stamp, but we let that go. But, you know, then the day came when children came into the world, and with children there came diapers and formula and uh, all those glorious hand-holding, mooning-away kinds of days came to a very rapid change. There was a change in how things worked. There were new policies. Instead of staying up till midnight, we went to bed at 8.30 because we knew there was a child going to be crying at 5.30 in the morning. And you can see this pattern even in the home that progressively there are different ways of operating. You'll remember that that's in the Bible as well. You'll remember that when Cain killed his brother Abel, God set a mark on him so that he would not be put to death. And yet you will remember that after the flood, God says that because man is made in the image of God, whoso sheddeth man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. You can see that of necessity there is a change in the way that God is working with people. What does Acts 17 say? The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. So again, I want to make this point that while God never changes, his ways of dealing with men do in fact change. And in any particular period of history, this is what we want to see. What is God showing about himself? How is God testing man? And what is man's response to what God has done? Now, there are about 20 minutes left or so, and I want to uh, really drill down now to the uh, concept of dispensations as we find them in the Bible. And you say, that was uh, 40 minutes of talk, and now we're going to get down to the real stuff. Um, I think it's necessary to establish some basics, because if you just dive into the subject, I think it will be divorced from the great truths about God that underlie or undergird what we have to say. Now, let me just say this, that not all Christians agree on the number of dispensations or the names that should be given to them. I have to admit to you that when I was in my late teens and early 20s, I had a real crisis in my own little heart about this subject of dispensationalism. I had been raised with it. It was the belief of my father and mother. It was the belief of the assembly that I was a part of. It was a belief of the servants who came and ministered to us. And because I was a rebellious brat, I assumed that if it was old and everybody else believed it, um, the heady days of the 1960s and the Beatles, I probably ought to believe something else. And so I, I sort of went away from it for a short time, but I came back to it. 
And I came back to it in the simple way that I'm going to try and demonstrate for you today. I want to read with you in the scriptures, first of all. And I am going to put a little timeline up, and for the balance of my time with you, I am going to work from this timeline, because this timeline attempts to demonstrate the fact that the subject of dispensations spans eternity to eternity, because since God is the one who ordains the dispensations, God is working for his glory, then what we are doing is a totally embracing thing. So read with me now, and let's begin to divide this. Let us read in John's Gospel, chapter 1. And we are going to read what I judge to be the single most important verse on this topic. Because in a verse, it is a verse that centers itself in Christ. It is a verse that centers itself in the cross. And therefore, this verse is of greatest importance. John's Gospel, chapter 1, and I am going to read in at verse number 15. John chapter 1 and verse 15, John, bear witness of him. And cried, saying, This is he of whom I spake, he that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me, and of his fullness have all we received, and grace for grace. Verse 17 is the verse that I'm looking at. For the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. In this verse, we are introduced to the most fundamental division of time. I'm not sure, I've heard men say it is the most important division of eternity. I'm not sure that you can divide eternity, so I'll omit that particular language. But I want to say this, the cross of Jesus Christ divides everything. You know, I, I don't know, this is a little sidelight. You know, one of the memes that is repeated frequently today is a, a, a view of the Lord Jesus that is aberrant and foreign to our scripture. It is the idea that the Lord Jesus is the great uniter. Now, I'm well aware that the Lord Jesus in his high priestly prayer prayed that they may all be one. By the way, that was answered on the day of Pentecost, and there is no further application for that verse, at least in its interpretation. But people like to see the Lord Jesus as this very kindly Boy Scout leader who gathers everybody into his arms, and we all hold hands around the campfire and sing Kumbaya, and gentle Jesus, meek and mild, and everything about Christ is just soft and unjudgmental and uniting. I want to tell you that the Lord Jesus Christ is the most divisive man that ever lived. You say, can you support that? Three times over in John's Gospel, it says, there was a division among the people because of him. Let me tell you that Jesus Christ divides everything. He certainly divides this audience. Because in this room, there are people who are saved and on their way to heaven. Doubtless, there are those who are not saved here. By the way, if you're not saved, I, I can't get away from being an evangelist. It is my hope and prayer that as we talk about the unfolding of the ages, that you might be caused in this age to receive the Lord Jesus as your Savior, lest you should face him, not as Savior, but as judge in the age to come. And our brethren are going to be talking about some of the wrath of God that is poured out in a coming age. You flee from the wrath to come. And even while we're giving ministry, it would be a wonderful thing to be saved in a ministry meeting. Many people have been as we speak about the Lord Jesus. But let me just say this, the Lord Jesus is a great divider. And his cross, his work, his life on earth divides everything. Look at our little picture up here. What John tells us is up until this point, there, there has been a dispensation. There has been a way that God has related himself to man, and that has been through the law. Now, that dispensation is ultimately a very frustrating dispensation. There's a lot of work to be done. 
people with lambs and goats and pigeons and turtle doves and offerings and tabernacles and temples and pilgrimages to Jerusalem. Aren't you glad you don't live under the law? I am. I'm glad that on uh, Saturday morning, like right now, I'm not in here with a goat under each arm. Uh, I'm glad to be in this present dispensation. It was, it was deeply frustrating, that dispensation, because no one found perfect peace with God. You see, it actually demonstrated the inability of man by the blood of bulls and goats to permanently put away sin. And that is why Paul writes of the great relief of this coming change of dispensations when he said the law was a schoolmaster to lead us to Christ. And I could almost hear the great sigh of relief in his voice as he thought about the day that the law, with all its frustration, was ended. That doesn't mean, by the way, that the law was bad. The law was good. It was revealing God. It was revealing the heart of man. It was carrying forward the purposes of redemption. But how wonderful that day when Christ came. And now there is a new stewardship, dispensation. We read this in Ephesians chapter 3 of God's grace. And of course, the emphasis is on the content of the preaching at that time. The grace of God preached through the gospel displayed in Jesus Christ. So if you want to be the simplest of dispensationalists, may I just commend this simple diagram to you. You could reasonably understand the Bible by dividing the dispensations like this. Before Christ, before the cross, There was the era of law. The law came by Moses. But now we have entered by the Lord Jesus into a new dispensation. Grace and truth have come by Jesus Christ. Now, I want to show you another foil. And I want to read a couple of other verses with you. Let us read then in Romans chapter 5. And again, I hope you won't be offended at the simplicity of the way that I'm doing this, but I discover that being simple also equals being memorable. And so I want you to remember this. Romans chapter 5 then, and verse 14. Or actually, let me back up to verse number 12. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 12. Wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. For until the law, sin was in the world. But sin is not imputed when there is no law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses even over them that had not sinned after the similitude of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that is to come. Now, I want to take you very simply from two dispensations to three. Because clearly in this text, we learn that there is something that was going on before the law. And you understand that before you get to Exodus chapter 20, you have the entire uh, episode of, of all that takes place. Uh, in the book of Genesis and the early history of Israel, particularly in Egypt. And Paul describes that as being before the law. Now, I'm not going to spend much time trying to make that more granular. I will show you a slide in a few minutes that shows that even that period has been divided further. But nonetheless, we want to understand that what happened on Mount Sinai was the introduction, as the law was given by the administration of angels, and as as Moses came down from the mountain, and God began to clearly explain his holiness, that's the Ten Commandments, his holy standard, as God began to give the constitution for a holy nation, as God began to describe the practical lives of a holy people, God is opening up a new dispensation. So you can see that I don't have three up here. I didn't want to make too many slides. But let's read again Hebrews chapter 6. And I will justify my division into a fourth dispensation. 
We have already read in the book of Ephesians, but I will read now in the book of Hebrews, chapter 6, and verse number 4. And I do not want to debate this. I have very strong and settled opinions about what the text means, but I'm not trying to give an exposition here. I'm just trying to draw a, an expression, for it is impossible for those who were once enlightened, verse 5, Hebrews chapter 6, and have tasted of the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost, and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come. So now I have doubled your understanding, I hope, of the dispensations, because we may at the very least then divide it like this. There is a time before the ages. It's called eternity. And God, who is the author of the ages and the king of the ages, in creation begins to work in time which he created. There is a period from Adam to Moses. It is described as before the law. There is a time from Moses to Christ. It is the administration of the law. There is a time from Christ, and I'm going to argue very strongly that it is until the rapture, and uh, that is uh, certainly this era of grace that we are now in. And, of course, there is the day of the kingdom or the age to come. And so we know that we are not living in the final era of human history. And that's why the, uh, the hand-wringing of the environmentalists and other people makes very little impression upon us. We are dependent upon a faithful covenant-keeping God. And seed time and harvest and the seasons and the years are not going to fail. And actually, this era will end gloriously for us, tragically for the world. But God, in his great purposes, does indeed have an age to come. Now, before I get done in six or seven minutes, I, I want to just show you one more thing. And I don't think today that we are going to deal with any of these in detail. But Mr. Schofield, in his Bible, actually divides history into seven dispensations. Uh, he talks about the time that Adam was in the garden as being the dispensation of innocence. This is one of the areas that I personally struggle with because I believe that Adam sinned right away. I don't think that Adam... Is that okay with you, Brother Jackson? Good. I have one friend over here. Uh, you know, I don't think that Adam was created and lived for a billion or a trillion years, and then one day uh, Adam and Eve sinned. I don't think that's the sense of reading the Bible. I believe in a young earth, and I believe that sin came very quickly after the creation. I'm not prepared to say that it happened on the eighth day or something like that. The Bible does not say that, but I'm willing to say that if this is a dispensation, it's an awfully short one. It might only be one day long or two days long, and so I'm not really, I don't know about that. Certainly there is the era of conscience that exists between the fall and when God, and between the flood when God establishes human government. And God establishes, for example, capital punishment, that when blood is shed, that there is corresponding blood that needs to be shed, and God gives to policemen and to judges and to courts and to the government the power to govern and to recompense human life. There is the era of promise, and in that particularly we see the time of Abraham and the fathers and the great promises and the covenants that God has given, and then the following ones are the ones that I've described to you of law and of grace and of kingdom. And I would just encourage you to acquire some sound dispensational books, and they're out there. And I would encourage you at your own leisure to study um, these great dispensations. And so I would say this, that while it is not important to agree on the exact details, it is very important to see that there are different dispensations. Let me just say one other little thing that I think will be a great help to you. It is important to see that the ages do not open and close with split-second precision. I think all of us would be nicer if we had proof texts for everything, if we could just draw big red lines in our Bible and just make everything cut and dry. That is the great folly of our empirical age. But God doesn't work like that. 
And it's very interesting to see that there are often overlaps or transition periods. You can see this in the book of the Acts. And I'm not one of those men who has, in the words of a famous Irish preacher, I don't have transition on the brain. But I'm well aware that there are transitional periods. These things do not uh, start and stop instantly. It is possible that there will be a period of time between the rapture and the tribulation during which the man of sin will be revealed and the temple will be erected in Jerusalem. Uh, we're just doing what we call gross anatomy here. And we're not trying to establish hard and fast starts and stops, but I, I just want you to understand that. I need to bring this little message to a close. I want to just talk to you for a second about a great doxology that ends that, that in our Bible. And it, it helps me, at least, in my appreciation of the dispensations and my appreciation of what God is doing. I'm just looking here to make sure that there's nothing that I really wanted to talk about. I, I would say this before I read my doxology, that we need to rightly handle the Word of God. We need biblical accuracy. It's not just enough to hold our Bibles and to have fuzzy ideas of what God is doing. It's important that we see how he is working and what he is doing. And I think that as my brothers get up and drill down beyond my introduction into some of the specifics that you are going to find that this is going to be a great blessing for us. The doxology that I want to close with is found in the book of Jude. And I'm not going to read it from the King James Version. I'm going to read it from a very highly honored version called Darby's uh, New Testament. John Nelson Darby was a leader in the Brethren Movement and a man whose uh, translation of the Bible um, is very sound and very respected. And this is how he translates Jude, verse 25. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, might, and authority from before the whole age and now and to all the ages. Amen. I love that verse. That is the ultimate statement of a dispensationalist, that we worship and adore and exalt a Savior who is before the age, who has been revealed in the age, and will be honored and glorified throughout all the ages. May God help us in our further studies that God's great eternal purposes in this world may be more clearly seen, and that the Lord Jesus will stand out as God's great administrator of those ages, and that you and I might not only have our heads informed intellectually about how God has divided the ages, but that our hearts might be warmed to this blessed Savior who stands at the very center of all of God's purposes for the ages.